Well, good morning, church. We're going to be looking briefly here at Psalm 147, verse number one. Psalm 147, verse number one, and it says this. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. It is pleasant, and look at this, and a song of praise is fitting. Let me read it again. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant, and a song of praise is is fitting. You know what that means? If you are a child of God, it is appropriate, it is right, it is fitting for you to give praise to God. And we want to start out our service by that today, by taking a moment and worshiping the Lord together before we sing together. And so here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like to invite you to find somebody around you and just take a moment and pray and praise the Lord. Don't ask for God for anything right now. Just let's worship the Lord as we begin. So maybe you want to begin a time of prayer with these simple words. Lord, I praise you because. Okay, I'm going to do one more thing today. One more thing today. I'm going to throw some of you off. All right. Pastor Eddie mentioned on the live stream, when you watch the video, you can't see any of you lovely folks. So if you would be willing when you're doing this, if we could come down here and gather, if you'd be open to doing that, find some folks near the front that you'd like to pray for, pray with, and then stay there, okay? All right, so that's the secret. Here we go, ready? One, two, three, break. Find some folks to pray with. Praise the Lord. If you're willing to come down front, we'd love to have you down here. It'll encourage Pastor Rod as he preaches to us today. Good morning, everyone. Hello. Okay, I'm on right now. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. We have come this morning to worship our Lord and God, Jesus Christ. Please stand up and let's sing praise to the Lord, the Almighty. i 
Kiss my dad, my mind to Calvary, where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands and feet, my Savior.
We're going to continue our series here this morning through the book of Genesis and the life of Abraham called Forward in Faith. And this week we'll be looking at a passage from Genesis chapter 18. So if you turn in your Bibles with me, Genesis chapter 18 verses 11 and following is what we'll be looking at here in the next few minutes. I want to read this passage of scripture together with us. And we have a little tradition here that when we read the text of scripture, we say, this is God's word and you say... Thanks be to God. Very good. So I'm going to read for us Genesis chapter 18, verses 11 and following. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and advanced in years. The way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh and say, Shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Verse number 14, Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is God's word. So we're going to see once again that our journey forward in faith is not about the caliber or the size or the quality of our faith. But it's really about the faithfulness of our God. And here's the reality. Many of us can be like Sarah, right? God makes a promise and we doubt. We laugh. Can God really do that in my life? Can God really meet me in my time of trouble? Will God really be faithful to his promises? And before we hear God's word preached, you know what we want to do? We want to confess that often our hearts are filled with unbelief. We need the Lord this morning to restore and strengthen and renew our faith. I I love the song that we just sang, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And the, the Bible, or that song says that when we look at the cross, when we look at what God has done, what does it cause us to do? Actually pour contempt on our pride. We see the greatness and the love and the mercy of God, and it causes us to see freshly 
We are needy people. That's what we want to do right now. We want to confess our need for the Lord in the next few minutes. So I'm going to lead us in a time of prayer. Then I'd like to pause and really ask you to talk to the Lord. Maybe you have a particular need in your life right now that you're keenly aware of your dependency on the Lord. Maybe there's an area of sin that the Lord's been dealing with you in and you need to confess that to God right now. I want to encourage us all to talk to the Lord about our need for him. Let's pray together. Father, we have sang of your greatness. Praise to the Lord. Praise the name of our God. You are great. You are faithful. You are worthy. You are kind, you are merciful, you are magnificent. <laughs> and Lord, we often doubt all those things about you. Our hearts are filled with unbelief. We have pride. We have fears. And Lord, I pray right now, we just confess them to you. We bring them to you. Lord, we confess our need for our good shepherd right this morning. Pray that you would show yourself faithful to us once again, or your faithless people at times. So right now, talk to the Lord about how you need him this morning. Just take a minute and say, Lord, I need you. Father, you have said in your word that if we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that you will exalt us. Lord, you have said if we cast our burdens on you, you will sustain us. You have said that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Lord, we come. We come to the healer. We come to the balm of Gilead right now and we confess our woundedness, our brokenness. Lord, would you come in power? Would you come in cleansing? Would you come in renewal? Would you come in strengthening by your spirit? I pray for Pastor Rod as he opens your word this morning. Lord, would you have your hand on him freshly? We need to hear from you. Lord, would you help us this morning? In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Would you stand on your feet and sing one more time before Rod comes?
Good morning, both Gospel Hope and First Baptist. It's good to see you. Uh, just uh, checking in real quick, do we have anyone who is visiting with us, uh, whether it be your first or second time? Can I just kind of show you some love? I see your brother. It's good to see you. Did we see, I see any other hands that I might have missed? All right. I know that there's some others out there, um, but this is just one of the more awkward times during any church service. The moment you identify yourself uh, as a guest, you are going to be subjected to all of this random love uh, at some point where people are going to come out introducing themselves and greeting you. But that's all right. Um, we know who you are, and you will get your share. Uh, Kathy, Kathy Watts, did you come back in? That's right. That's right. I was, I was wondering if we were going to have to issue a Kathy alert. You know, that's kind of that thing where someone sees a nice baby at church and just decides to not only coddle it, but then just kind of leave with it and not come back. Uh, but, but Alan, we got you, so I'm figuring you, you'll be returning that baby. Um, <laughs> good stuff. Um, tell her I said that uh, when, when she gets back in here. Um, let's pray for it and ask for the Lord's help this morning as we um, get ready to open his word. Um, Father, in the name of Jesus, we are thankful to you for every opportunity to do so, to open your word and to allow you to breathe on us, to allow you to look into our lives, to expose us, and then to explain to us, Lord God, not only your infinite greatness, but how desperately we need you. Uh, would you help me this morning? Do more than help me, oh God. Uh, just use me to your disposal, whether you call it help or uh, enablement or uh, just in spite of myself, Lord God, would you do whatever it is you desire to do in this moment? I find great joy in the words of Paul and great intrigue when he says, when I came in amongst the Corinthian church, I claimed to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified, so that the peoples of faith would not rest in his oratory ability, but in uh, a demonstration of the Spirit. Lord God, would you let there be a demonstration of the Spirit? Let there be absolute confidence and clarity that you have shown up and said something that only you can say through such a, uh, a broken an illegitimate vessel as myself. Let it be clear that you have been here among us. And with that clarity, bring about conviction and conversion, Lord God, in conformity to the image of your son, Jesus Christ. This is our earnest prayer in the matchless and holy name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So as you've already heard from Pastor Ryan, we are continuing in our series entitled Forward in Faith. Forward in Faith. And you also heard Pastor Ryan mention that as we're going through this analysis or this teaching of Abraham's life, what we are to be blown away by is the grandeur of God and his faithfulness and not so much the big, massive faith of Abraham or Sarah, because we can clearly see in multiple moments that they don't necessarily bring to the table all of that special faith, even though we do refer to Abraham as the godfather of faith. Now, one must ask the question that if God's promises and the fulfillment of them are not contingent upon human beings being at their best, why is God so committed to having us participate in this way? Why does it seem as if he puts all of this weight on us, if you will, to participate and to seemingly grow in our faith if it's not a contingency, 
if it's not a contingency to the follow through and the fulfillment of his promises. As we explore that question, the answer to that question this morning, I want to be talking to you from the, uh, from the topic of the mercy rule, the mercy rule. Anybody familiar with the mercy rule or at least some variation of it, right? Uh, in, the, in athletic competition, the mercy rule is typically employed, particularly in non-professional sports, uh, that if one team is beating another team mercilessly, there is a certain point in the game where the officials invoke what is known as the mercy rule. That is, they immediately stop the game to preserve the dignity of the losing team and to prevent or to promote greater sportsmanship amongst the winning team. The mercy rule uh, is utilized not only in sports, but I believe in a variety of different games. Like for instance, in spades, uh, if one of the teams has amassed more books than the other team could possibly ever come back from, there is a version of the mercy rule that is invoked. The mercy rule runs throughout human life. But there's another area of life where mercy appears, and you may not even know it, and how beneficial it is to our growth and development. Because I do believe that God utilizes mercy to grow us, not just to stop certain things from happening to us. Let me explain. Um, I'm fascinated in some regards by exercise science and kinesiology. When you look at a muscle, oftentimes from the exterior, it just looks like one. But listen to the very names of muscles. Bicep, it's really two. Tricep, it's really comprised of three. The quadricep, we could go on. It's really four muscles working together. But externally, it looks like one. But did you know that in order to grow these muscles effectively, to grow them, not just tone them, to grow them, that you must progressively overload them and sometimes even slightly tear them? That subtle soreness that you feel after a really good workout is an indication that you're on your way to actual growth. Because as those tiny micro tears, these intentional micro tears in the muscle heal, that new muscle is stronger and grows larger than it would have been before. So think about this in your minds for just a moment. When you see a person doing a bench press, they have behind them sometimes what's known as a spotter. That is a person who is designed to stand there and keep the weight from crushing them once they have reached the end of themselves where they can't do any more. But the reality is the spotter isn't just a safety protocol, it is a growth strategy. Because without progressive overload, the person doing the exercise won't ever grow past their previous limits. What does this have to do with God and the gospel and him keeping his promises or his faithfulness? I'll tell you. I believe that the Lord progressively allows the human life to be overloaded at times. But he serves as a great and faithful spotter because he wants to grow us to, into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Not just wants to. The Bible says that for those of us who know Jesus, we have been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. In other words, just as faithful as God is to the fulfillment of his own promises, one of his promises is that those that belong to him will grow to look like his son. And so actual acts of mercy, where God serves as a great spotter in our lives when we being progressively overloaded, is indeed a demonstration of one of his promises. And so, um, ideally, I believe that through looking at this little window of Abram's life, we're going to look at several chapters, and I promise it'll be, I can't promise it'll be painless because then you won't grow, um, but I'll promise it'll be, uh, it'll be nice to you, for you. But, um, I believe that we should grow to, we should appreciate the mercy of God as a means of building our faith. We need to grow to appreciate the mercy of God as a means of actually building our faith. Now, we talked a good deal about mercy. What is it? I'll give you a working definition. Mercy is the goodness of God applied, applied to an area of my life where I, where, excuse me, mercy is God not giving me what I deserve. And his grace is giving me what I do not deserve. All right? So mercy is God not giving me what I deserve. And grace is him giving me what I do not deserve. I know the two of them are often mentioned in tandem, but I want you to also think about them kind of like how these muscles work collaboratively. They are always in the room together, but that's specifically what's happening when you and I experience mercy. We're not getting exactly what we deserve. 
And so when we think about the mercy of God and the way it's going to be displayed in the lives of Abraham, um, in the life of Sarah, as well as in the life of Lot, is that we're going to see an, imp- uh, an application of God's goodness toward their mercy and th- or toward their lives in three distinct ways. We're going to see God apply his goodness to weariness, weakness, and wickedness. The goodness of God. The goodness of God applied. Mercy is the application of God's goodness to my weariness, my weakness, as well as my wickedness. So you've read this brief passage here in the story of Abraham and Sarah, where God has made a promise. But I want you to think that even prior to that, how Abraham and Sarah have really almost gotten ahead of God, tried to shortcut the promises of God or tried to help God because they really didn't fully understand his mercy just yet. You see, in Genesis chapter 16, the promise is already on the table. It's been on the table for a full chapter now. And uh, uh, Genesis chapter 16, verses 9 through 16, read this way. The angel of the Lord said to her, this is talking to Hagar, you know, real quick. Uh, God's talking to Hagar, or the angel of the Lord is speaking to Hagar, because Abraham and Sarah, or Abram and Sarah, received God's promise that they're going to have a child. The child hasn't come yet. And so Sarah decides to tell Abram to go into his servant and conceive a child that way, because you're not going to get one through me. Let's just go ahead and help God out a little bit. And they give birth to a child, or this child is conceived, and Hagar then, after she's conceived, is subject to a lot of animosity from Sarah. She hates the fact that her maidservant, Hagar, has now been able to conceive, but she's not been able to conceive. And this great contempt results in her telling Hagar to get out. She just needs to leave the house. I don't want to see her anymore. And the scenario that we're kind of walking into is where God swoops in and shows mercy to Hagar. It says, and the angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has listened to your affliction. So Ishmael's name means the Lord has listened to your affliction. He shall be as a wild donkey of a man, and his hand will go out against everyone, and everyone's hand shall be against him, and he will dwell over against all his kinsmen. And so she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, you are the God of seeing. For she said, truly, I have, surely here, I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore, uh, this place was well called Ber lo uh, lies between Kadesh and Bered. And Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram called his name, whom Hagar bore Ishmael, and he was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Why does this even matter? Why can't we fast forward to the rest of God's will for them? It matters because if you think about who Ishmael is, we've officially given birth to this generation that will be known historically as the Gentiles. And what's interesting about this generation known as the Gentiles is that God still seems to have a plan and a promise for even working with and through them. He's going to multiply Ishmael and his descendants, even though this is not necessarily the promised one through, um, uh, through, uh, through Isaac. But the weariness of God, excuse me, the weariness of Hagar is seen by God in a very interesting way. Uh, the weariness or the mercy of God applied to our weariness is this statement. The Lord recognizes when we are being faced with more affliction than we can handle. Hagar was in a position where she had been essentially removed from employment. I want you to think about this not as an American, but think about it as an ancient Near Eastern earner, if you can. Here is Hagar, who is an Egyptian. These are all the descriptions that the Bible gives us. These are all the facets of her affliction. She's an Egyptian, right? So she's not amongst her people. She is a servant, so she's not in a high position. She is a single mom because she has this child by Abram, and they are now asking her to leave. She's unemployed. She is homeless because she is separated from the place that provided her with shelter. And she lives in a, in a, in a place where there are no social constructs. To, she, she's not going to go to an office and, and get social security or unemployment. She's not anticipating the next stimulus package. 
She is not going to be able to go down to the uh, staffing agency and find other placement in another home to be a servant. You understand that all of the things weighing against Hagar at this moment are deeply destitute. They represent almost a death sentence for her. This is a, a life that is crashing down with all of these, these, these weighty details. And who steps in? God. He says, I see you and I hear you. Now, what's so interesting is he says, I see you and I hear you. And that is enough for Hagar to have fresh hope. You recognize that sometimes when our deepest places of despair, we, we don't necessarily need full-blown solutions to all of the things that are pressing against us. We just need to know that someone sees us and hears us. And that is a reflection or a demonstration of God's mercy. He sees when we have endured what, which essentially is too much for us. But like a great spotter, he doesn't just stand there and say, hey, I see you and I hear you. He provides great relief. He takes some of that weight off of us through his word and through his means. Uh, the Lord responds to our weariness with whatever he feels is needed in that moment to rebuild our hope. We will not use this passage to say that every single time you find yourself afflicted and overwhelmed, God's going to bless you with some stupendous blessing that's going to blow your socks off. But you can believe that every time you feel yourself deeply overwhelmed, that God hears you and sees you, and that he is going to speak in a way that it will go to him in a way that gives us the hope that we need in that moment. God responds to our weariness. But there is something even bigger that is happening in this passage that I want to read for you, and I hope that you see it, because I believe that we are getting an early reflection of a great gospel truth that will not unfold for us fully until we get to the New Testament. Think about who all the descendants of Ishmael are. They are not a people. They are not a part of the original product of, of what God is doing. That will all come out of Isaac. But look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and following. But you are a chosen race, that's talking about us, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of God who called you out of darkness. So they're not talking about Jewish people here, who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people. That's not a badge that belongs to the Hebrews, that's a badge that belongs to us who were, who were outside. He says, you were once not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received what? Mercy, but now you have received mercy. What we see God doing in the life of Hagar is, is kind of really just this early preview of God's plan to incorporate into the grand fabric of his great people, even those who may have been born outside. Man, have you ever felt like you were born in the wrong place? the wrong time, amongst the wrong people, under the wrong circumstances, and because of that, you feel weary that there is no hope for you in God? Are you looking across the street socially and emotionally saying, if I had just grown up like that and in that family with all that religion and with all that money and under all those circumstances and in that kind of neighborhood, my life would be exponentially better? That's not the view of God. God has a plan for all people of all types, whether you feel like you're an insider or an outsider. And so when you have that great weariness weighing down on you, take it before the Lord. He wants to hear you, and you need to know that he wants to see you, and he, he does see you. There are going to be many times in life when it seems like the circumstances that are weighing on us are too much for us to bear, and you are right. You are right when you recognize that they are too much for you to bear. That is actually the point of God as he is growing you into the image of his son, that you finally recognize that these circumstances are too much for you. Your weary is a righteous weariness when it is handed over to God so that he can show you his tender mercies. But there's another act of mercy that is apparent in the life of Abraham and Sarah, or at least within their orbit. It's not just God's plan for Hagar and Ishmael, which allow us to see how God uses his mercy toward our weariness, but we see a second one that I mentioned to you up front, and it is what? It also starts with a W. Our weakness. That's right, our weakness. Now, I hope you're paying attention to what the Bible does in terms of detail and don't skip any of it. 
In Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 5, the Bible reads as follows, And Abram was 99 years old when the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and I may multiply you greatly. And then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be a father to a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but you shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of multiple nations. This too, brothers and sisters, is a demonstration of God's mercy, where it is not necessarily a, a display of God's goodness toward weariness, it is toward his innate weakness. Now notice when we read the passage, the Bible wanted us to know that Abram is now 99. Do you know that these conversations between God and Abram started back in chapter 15 or start when they first started that Abram was actually 75? So here we are 24 years later and Abram in his human frame is still waiting for the promises of God to come into full view. I mean, from our perspective, right? No wonder he seems to be taking all of these alternative measures to seem to get the will of God kind of moving because it seems to be slow, right? But, but why would God wait until he's 75 and then later he would have another encounter with God when he was 86? That's when they conceived Ishmael. Or, 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 or now here it is, God's coming back when he's 99. Why would God do this and why does the Bible want us to see it? I believe that God wants to see it because there are times in our lives where we feel like not only, God, are you putting on us too much, but Lord, you are taking too long. You are taking too long. And, and, and when we believe that the Lord is taking too long, our weakness shows up in a couple of different ways. Our weakness shows up in ways where we say to ourselves, Lord, I don't know if you have forgotten about me or if you have forgotten about me. In other words, Lord, have you forgotten about me in the fact that I exist? Have you just totally put me in your eternal review mirror? Or have you forgotten about me? Did you forget that I was 75 when we first started talking? Did you forget, Lord, that I am, that I am 20 years past retirement age? Did you forget how old I am? Did you forget biology? Did you forget who my wife is? Did you forget what town I live in? Did you forget how long I've been at this church? Did you forget, Lord God, that, that the world doesn't use people my age? Did you forget that I'm past my prime? Lord, did you forget? Now, we may never say these things to God, but we say these things to God. We, we take a back seat. We take a back seat in so many different ways when we believe that we are past the point of optimal usefulness. And that is no point of, there, that point does not exist in God. And I hope that encourages us in our weakness. The weakness of Abraham and Sarah show up in two incredible ways, and then the mercy of God shows up in one incredible way. The weakness, oh, excuse me, the, the, the mercy of God shows up in this way, that the Lord wants us to recognize what we are unable to do so that it is undeniable that he is the one who did it. So we talk about this progressive overload. The Lord wants us to recognize what we are totally and completely unable to do so that it is undeniable that he is the one who did it. Our weakness plays a role in the seeing of God's mercy and a show of God's strength and an understanding of his great capabilities over against our own. And the Lord will allow this to, to go on for whatever duration is necessary for us to reach the end of ourselves and cease to think that we are actually helping God rather than being graciously and mercifully allowed to participate in what he is doing. When you think about the age of Abraham and as well as well, Abram and Sarah, it's emblematic quite clearly that there is a certain weakness that we have in our flesh. And the Lord isn't necessarily trying to draw us past our prime. He's just trying to draw us past our self-deficiency. When you look at the laughter of Sarah, it demonstrates a weakness that is inherent in all of our faith. And while I would never dare laugh at God, I believe that we have all stood in the door of our tent and in our hearts somehow smirked and believed or disbelieved that something could happen. And the Lord hears that smirk just as loudly as if we said it in a bullhorn in the middle of the town square. But he still shows mercy and chooses 
to use us chooses to use us because when we laugh at God, you know what we're doing? Even if it doesn't show up as a ha-ha, we are conflating the difference between what is possible for him and what is practical for us. You know, there's part of us that says, well, Lord, I know you can do all things, but I just don't know if I'm going to be able to participate in any meaningful way. I'm past my ability of optimal utilization. Sometimes our belief that we are past God's use is not just because of age, maybe it's because of sin. Maybe it's because of some other circumstance. Maybe it's just some of a variety of different things that we look at our lives and say, well, I'm totally disqualified from any optimal utilization. And God says, I'm the one who's doing the qualifying, not you. And so he shows mercy to continue to work through both the weakness of their flesh and the weakness of their faith that they have clearly showcased to God, both in their laughter and in their willingness to go out and conceive Ishmael. But God is still willing. The Lord is constantly updating our identity to match the activity that he wants to see in our lives. Did you notice that when we first read this passage that he went to them and as, as Abram would surrender to God in faith, he would say, okay, now I'm going to change your name from father to Abraham, which means father of many. The Lord recognizes that in us there are innate inabilities to do certain things and therefore he is always upgrading our identity. This is a fundamental truth for the New Testament believer because when we, are, when, we, when we place faith in Christ, we don't just believe in him at a distance. We are then in Christ and we become new creatures. In other words, our fundamental identity is changed to match, the new ide- to match the new activity that God wants to do in our lives, which is going to exceed any innate capabilities that we have. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, for while we were still weak... At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one would scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person would would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, God anticipated the weakness of man, and this is the great display, the grand display of his mercy. He anticipates our weakness, but he also participates in our weakness. He anticipates our weakness in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus who dies on our behalf before we even knew we were sinners, too weak to do his will on our own. But then he participates in our weakness by coming in human form and taking upon him the form of a servant and undergoing the same afflictions and difficulties that we do in life. So in Christ, God shows great mercy to us all in the outworking of the cross. Final, final one here. Number three, you say them back to me. What was number one? The mercy of God is applied to our weariness, to our weakness, and then finally to our, to our wickedness. One of the scenarios that's going down here in the scriptures in Genesis chapter 18, verses 23 through 26, is that uh, the Lord grew angry with what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah, and of course, that's where Lot and his family live. And uh, Abram, uh, Abraham is now interceding or pleading with the Lord not to fully destroy the city. As a matter of fact, he says, hey, would you, the righteous God, the righteous judge, destroy the righteous along with the unrighteous? Is that what you're going to do? And this is an interesting thing because when it comes to wickedness, how exactly is God going to be integrous? How is he going to manage this? You see, the the, the Bible lets us know quite clearly that God somehow is able to show a whole lot of patience with wickedness without leveraging his holiness. He can be really patient, which is a show of mercy, without necessarily having to eat away or destroy his holiness and his character. And he shows us this in the way that he handles the situation with Lot by making a way of escape. But before he makes his way of escape, he allows us to see this conversation of intercession between Abraham and himself. In this conversation of intercession where where Abram is asking to God, if we could find this many righteous, will you keep the city? What about this many righteous? Or what about that many righteous? And he's progressively working that number down, and God is saying, yep, if we can find all those. Now, are he and God, you know, sitting at the table like some kind of, you know, union steward and, and the company? No. No, no. God's not negotiation. But this isn't negotiation. This is synchronization. 
As a matter of fact, I believe that this is the total ethic of all prayers. It's not about negotiation, regardless of how many times we go back to the Lord. It's about synchronization. It is about me and God getting on the same page concerning his will. And then when we're on the same page, he allows us to see something awesome of him. But God always knows exactly what he's going to do. But intercession is not instruction. Abraham is not telling God what to do. He is, he, is, he is interceding so that his heart for, for, the, for the unreached or, or the, 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 his heart for those who are in jeopardy is increased. God is building his capacity to know what mercy looks like through his own lens. What's so interesting about this particular um, passage here is that when you look at how patient God is with Abram or Abraham and how patient he is even with Lot, I think there's much learning to be done, but one particular place of learning is something that I see in 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 and following. But do not overlook this fact, behold, or beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief when the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned and dissolved and the earth uh, uh, and the works that are, that are done with it will be exposed. I believe here it is. We have kind of in Sodom and Gomorrah just kind of a, a sneak preview, if you will, of even what ultimate judgment looks like, where the Lord is not willing for any who are his, who are his to perish. And his mercy is demonstrated in two ways, creating a plan of action to get out those that are his, like in Lot's family, but also having great patience for those who need to come to their senses to get out of that place. When the Lord works mercy in, when, in our wickedness, know this, there's two things on deck. There is the call to repent if the sin is in us, and then there's the call to run if we're in the sin. We can be in environments that are, that are just overwhelming for us, and if we don't get out of them, we cannot be faithful to God. And I believe the Lord creates a way of escape, as is told to us by 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, that there is no trial or temptation that is too great for you, because with it, the Lord, by his faithfulness, will make a way of escape. What the Lord did in his mercy was made a way for Lot and his, pe and his family to escape this great environment of trial and temptation that were occurring there in Sodom and Gomorrah. And so as the Lord creates the way of escape, our role in the execution of his will becomes to run, to run, to flee youthful lust, to, to get out of the way of this impending judgment, as well as create as much distance between us and the sin as possible. And the Lord is able to do all of this without compromising his holiness, but show great patience. So I would urge you, if you are a person who right now is living in sin, you are up to your eyeballs in an environment or in personal activity and iniquity that you know does not honor God. And the duration that you have been allowed to remain there is making you comfortable in that environment. I am urging you and begging you to hear the voice and the volume of this particular text and get out now while the Lord has allowed your mind to be sober enough to see the way of escape. That is the mercy of God, the duration. Listen, if you're allowed to sit in sin for two and three years, don't say to yourself, well, I guess the Lord has lowered the bar on holiness. No, that's mercy trying to roll out the red carpet for you to get out. And so finally, Jude had these words to say, and I think they'll, found, they'll sound deeply familiar in contrast or comparison to what's happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. But you, beloved, build up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire to others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. There's just a certain sense of urgency that must accompany how we move when we experience the mercy of God in light of our own wickedness or the wickedness of others. We are called to not only be beneficiaries of mercy, but to also show great mercy. Now, all this business about mercy, is it just kind of a, uh, a third string quarterback in the grand team of God and what he's doing with the gospel? No, not at all. I believe a sober, straightforward look at the gospel reveals um, the, one of the most dramatic displays of mercy of all time. 
Consider, if you will, that what you have in the Lord Jesus Christ is humanity being faced with an overwhelming amount of sin that it itself, we ourselves, are too weary to work through. If you and I were to have to bear the weight of our own sin, we could not bear it. But it is God by his mercy that allows us to encounter the gospel. We encounter the gospel and we see that 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 weight of sin should not let rest exclusively on us, but we've got a great spotter in Christ. Let me take that off of you. I don't want you to be hurt by it. Will you place those sins on me? That's what happened in Christ. If you place faith in him, you have taken the weight of sin off your shoulders before you grow weary and place it on him. And we're called to go back there regularly as we recognize the weight of sin. Let me cast that on to Christ. That's God's mercy in the gospel. You may be saying, well, in terms of your weakness, understand that, 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 that in our flesh, you might, be, again, believe you're past your prime or past utilization, but the Bible says the, the, and in the millisecond that you're prepared to repent, God is prepared to cleanse, to use, to bring you close, that if you'll draw near to him, that he'll draw near to you. There is no time in your life where there is no expiration date on the strength of God in forgiveness. If you feel like you're too weak to get out of what you're in, you are. But by the power of the cross, you can come out. That's the only thing that makes it possible. And then finally, our wickedness. Glory be to God that when we've gotten ourselves way in over our heads like Lot. Lot was just making decisions in life that he thought represented the best case scenario for him and his herdmen and his family. Lot wasn't living a life of of lust, according to what we see in the book of Genesis. Lot was just saying, I think this is a good place to go. Lot was just choosing to move to a new city and a new place that he thought he could flourish in. And when he got there, he found himself to be overwhelmed. And God is saying, you know what, if that's you, you thought you made all the right decisions with all the right details and wisdom that you had available to you, and you find yourself up to your eyeballs and not knowing what to do, bring me that. Bring me, don't just bring me that, bring me you. I've made a way of escape for you. I don't know where you are, if you're the weary, if you're the weak, or if you're walking a place that's up to your eyeballs in wickedness and you just don't know what to do, the gospel is for you. A relationship with Jesus Christ is for you. He has voluntarily come and laid down his life substituted himself in your place and taking on the weight of sin, satisfied the wrath of God mercifully. That, that The wrath of God should be yours, but Jesus has fully satisfied the wrath of God in his own flesh by taking on the sting of death and separation from the Father. But it's not, the story doesn't end there. He is raised in victory over sin, death, and the devil. Anything that could possibly play upon your weakness, your wickedness, or your weariness, Jesus has gained victory over it, and you and I share in and experience that direct victory through the agency of the Holy Spirit and the grandeur of God's mercy when we place faith in Jesus Christ. It sounds like a lot, but it really is simple. Will you believe that God has done this on your behalf? Do you believe that mercy is really available to you? And the answer is undeniably yes. Can I pray for you? Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and I praise you for all these that have just taken time to listen. You know where each one of them are in their respective spaces in life. And you know, Lord God, what portion or what expression of your mercy they need in their lives in this time. Lord God, would you, would you, would you give them the want to, the appetite and the desire to reach out for you from amid their affliction or whatever is weighing on them. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. of God preached this morning. Let's stand up again, please, and worship one more time to our Lord and say, here I am to worship. Here I am. 
There, I turned it to mute. That was really good, what I just said. It was really wonderful. Life-changing. Yeah. The Lord, sorry. The Lord wants to remind us of what we cannot do so that we remember what He can do. Sometimes the Lord exposes our weakness to show us His strength. So praise the Lord for that wonderful truth from God's Word and the life of Abram. And thanks, Pastor Rod, once again for serving us so well. So can we praise the Lord for Pastor Rod this morning? Yeah. Hey, I want to do something, too, here before the announcements. Um, and if God is speaking to your heart in some way about your weakness, your wickedness, your weariness, at the end of the service, I'm going to ask Pastor Rod and Carrie if they would just be available down here. If you want to pray with them. Pastor Eddie, would you come right over here? If you just want to pray and say, man, I feel weak. I feel weary. I feel wicked. And I need the strength of God. These, these, these brothers and sisters would be happy to spend a minute praying for you. So right after service, they'll be available to pray. Hey, as we close, just a couple of announcements for you. First of all, Serve to Cab Week coming up. Uh, Serve to Cab is just an opportunity for our churches to get out in the community and be a blessing out there. We have a particular focus on our local schools this year. So we're collecting school supplies. We're going to have some backpacks that we're dropping off at several of the schools in our area. Now, here's the thing. We moved this back one week. So it was just starting next week. It's actually going to start July 25th 
through the 29th. There'll be lots of opportunities for you to get plugged in and serve. If you have any questions about that, please see Pastor Rod. He'd be happy to direct you in that way. Second, we're going to continue our equip class on why membership matters. That's going to be this Wednesday evening over in the Family Life Center. If you want to eat with us, meals are available starting at 6 p.m. You need to sign up either on the Church Center app or out here in the foyer. There's a sign-up sheet. Uh, you got to sign up today if you want food. If you just want to show up at 6.30 for the spiritual food, ah, see what I did there? Uh, you could just come. But if you want the physical food, if you're unholy and unspiritual and just want to eat food, you got to sign up today. And then last but certainly not least, man, we want to close out by giving generously to the Lord. Everything that we do is possible because of the generosity of God's people. There's several ways to give. You can give online. You can give on the Church Center app or right over here. There's a plate here for First Baptist and a box right over here for Gospel Hope. So church, in light of all of those things, our God is faithful in spite of our weariness, in spite of our wickedness, and in spite of our weakness. Very good. Uh, our God remains faithful. So Gospel Hope and First Baptist, you are sent.